Hi there. Praise God. You know what? Can we do one thing really quick? Uh, we saw Pastor Linda on the video, and she has worked so hard. She just got back from Germany, and I know they worked her day and night. Can we do one thing real quick before we get started? Can we stand up and just pray for her and bless her and, and pray that God would just strengthen her and refresh her? Because uh, God's wanting to do some things, some new things in our generation. And God's going to use her to do some of that, to be on the forefront of some of that. And we as a congregation are there with her to make it happen. So let's just pray for her right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up Pastor Linda and, and Bob. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that your refreshing is coming all over them. Your power, your ability, your strengthening is coming into them. Father, we release strategies from heaven to fill their hearts. Father, I thank you that nothing would, would excite her heart more than getting some strategies, some, some insights into exactly what's next, exactly what you want to do, exactly Exactly how you want to pour out your spirit on this generation. So, Father, we refresh her. We release refreshing to her in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that this will just be just the best trip she's ever been on in Jesus' name, that the rest of the trip and the trip home will just be so exciting and so refreshing for them. We bless her in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless. Okay, you can be seated. Well, my name is Spencer Nordyke. My wife here is Cindy. Cindy, stand up for a second, please. This is Cindy. And uh, we are just very excited about being here. We travel and minister all over the place. Uh, we've been in ministry for 30 some years and uh, uh, have been children's pastors, youth pastors, associate pastors, executive associate pastors, and uh, actually pastors in Bedford as well, right here down the street uh, for a bunch of years, Hurst and Bedford. And uh, the, the tagline underneath Nordyke Ministries is, reaching nations and generations. Now, I, I, feel like, I feel like a lot of you here, especially the prophetic team here at Empowering Life Church, knows us by the Spirit because they've ministered to us so many times and so powerfully, uh, but I, I, I don't feel like we really know each other very well yet, and so I'm going to try to fill in some blanks. And we've got, we've got a bunch of friends here with us this morning that came uh, to, to get ministered to that are generations that we've ministered to. Uh, Fred and Jill are from our youth group uh, from 25-something years ago uh, when we were youth pastors over in Dallas. Got a bunch of other people, uh, Russell, Terry, Ryan, uh, Ricky, uh, Kimberly, just a bunch of other people that were with us with uh, City Wave Church uh, here in the area. And so, you know, there's our generations right here. And so we've got the prophetic ministry that has been ministered to us here at Empowering Life Church, you guys have said nations over us so many times, and, uh, and generations as well. So we've got all of it together in the house today. Now, I just, I just want to just take a minute and tell you how we got here, okay? I don't mean we came down 121 and got off at Harwood. <laughs> I mean, how we ended up at Empowering Life Church, because, uh, you know, I, I, I think it'll give you a little bit of the depth of what's going on here. God's got some strategies. God's got some things that he's doing. And God's bringing people together to do it and to make it happen. Uh, a number of years ago, maybe eight years ago, uh, Cindy and I were at a women's conference that Linda Silverman was speaking at. And Kimberly was singing at. Kimberly, wave. Kimberly was singing at. And uh, uh, Cindy actually is a travel agent as well as a minister and was helping these ladies to put a cruise together for their women's group. And so we were there telling people about the cruise. Well, we had never met Linda, and she had never met us. She did not know who we were. And so we were there in one of the meetings one evening, and she came over to us and said, you know, who are you? What are your names? And, and uh, we told her, and she said, uh, pastors, that's who you are. That's what God is using. And then she started going into these other things too, prophetically, and said, sir, I see that your bags are packed, and I see you going to nations. And I see you going all over the place. Well, she didn't know that that morning I had packed my bags because the next day I was leaving for Spain. But she didn't know that. But the Holy Ghost knew that. Anyway, so we went, wow, we like this lady. You know, this is good. You know, this is God. We knew that it was God. Uh, several years later, we came and we heard uh, Pastor Ed, or Prophet Ed Trout uh, when the church was over here at First Assembly in Colleyville 
several times, came and visited a couple of times there, came here a couple of times and visited, and the Lord began to speak to us about attending here when we're in town and being a part of this body and uh, seeing what God wanted to do here. So that's how we got here, and we're very excited about being here and being a part of the body here because there's some things that God's wanting to do, okay? Now, when we were pastoring in Bedford, uh, I feel like we began to dust off some of the foundations of what God wanted to do in this area, in this region, okay? And so when the church ended up here in Bedford, let me get my ear thing going. When, the church, when this church ended up here in Bedford, it didn't surprise me at all because I know there's some prophetic destiny for this place. You know, years ago in the 50s, Bedford Boys Ranch was actually a boys ranch. It wasn't just a park, but it was a boys ranch and it took in young men who were going through lots of, you know, turmoil in their homes and, you know, parents couldn't handle them. They came to the Bedford Boys Ranch and they had a choir at the Bedford Boys Ranch that actually once a year at Christmas time uh, during the holiday season, they would go on the Lawrence Welk show. I just lost all of you right there when I said Lawrence Welk. <laughs> they would go on the Lawrence Welk show and they would sing. The boys from the Bedford Boys Ranch would go on the Lawrence Welk show and sing. And the whole world knew Bedford from the Bedford Boys Ranch. And when they heard the Bedford Boys Ranch uh, choir sing, they thought about all the good things that were happening here to help young people. Well, a number of years ago, we uh, had Youth Wave Church, and we were in Bedford, and we started a charter school for young people, and we were reaching out to kids who basically weren't making it in the public school system, and we were helping them, and we were helping them get their diplomas and get graduated and all of that. And uh, wow, talk about spiritual warfare. And, uh, but I feel like we began, by doing that, we began to dust off some of the spiritual foundations of what God wanted to do here. And I really believe that this church is set here prophetically to complete some things that God has really wanted to do here for families, for marriages, for young people, and really establish a picture of ministry and revival and outpouring. There's an outpouring coming to this church. There is an outpouring. You know, it's, I need to say this. I just feel the Holy Ghost. See, you know, when John the Baptist showed up, it was a stir. There was a stir. People were talking about it. There was a buzz. It's like, what's happening over there? What's going on over there? And people were excited, and people were curious, and people would come to see what was going on. And then Jesus showed up, and it, it was a bigger buzz and a bigger stir and a bigger excitement about what was happening. Well, then the Holy Ghost showed up, and there was a bigger, you know, 3,000 people got saved in one day, and there was outpouring everywhere, and people could not stay away. Well, I'm just going to tell you by the Spirit of the Lord, that's getting ready to happen in this area, in this region, and in this church. There's going to be an outpouring, and people are not going to be able to stay away, okay? Now, the foundations are being laid for all of this. And, uh, you know, you guys on the intercessory prayer team, you know, because you've been working on the foundation, and you've been, you've been just laboring to create this platform for this to happen and for what God wanted to do here. And so you know this is getting ready to happen. You can feel the buzz in the Spirit. So I'm just mentioning that to you so you'll expand your expectation a little bit to be able to, to take this in and say, yes, I expect that too. I believe that too. It's, and I, I told my wife Cindy the other morning when we were praying, I said, I feel like Simeon and Anna praying in Jesus when he came the first time in the temple. Simeon was praying God had shown him that he wasn't going to pass away until the Messiah came and he was going to see the Messiah. Boy, I, I bet that guy could pray, you know? And then Anna uh, was in there. She was, I don't know, she's like a hundred years old and she's in there. She had interceded. Her husband had passed away when she was young, like in her 20s. And she had spent the rest of that time, like 80 years, in the temple praying that Jesus would come. Well, God answered that prayer, and Jesus came. But I told Cindy the other day, I said, I feel like we're Anna and Simeon praying, God, send it now. God, send it here now. God, send it here now. Now, send it here. Because you know what? People are hurting, and people are 
people are wandering, and it's just ridiculous what's going on in our communities here. You know, Pastor Lindy gets back from Germany and talks about how hungry those people are and, and how they pack in, and, and there's an expectation there, and they want to see what's going on. That's getting ready to happen here, okay? Uh, God showed me a number of years ago that we're going to take over high school auditoriums, and then we're going to take over stadiums because the churches aren't going to be big enough. What churches like this are going to be are prayer centers. And then we're going to rent out Cowboy Stadium or Ranger Stadium to have the meetings that God wants to have. So I'm just trying to stretch you a little bit. Am I stretching you a little bit? Okay. Because can you get your expectors out there to expect some of this? Because it's time. It's time. It's time. American Idol has nothing on God. Okay. I'm serious. All right. It's true. You know, there's these things that the world is doing and people flock to see him and all of that. God will not be outdone. If you don't believe me, read the book of Exodus. You know, Egypt was doing this. Egypt was doing that. God showed up and it's like, oh, then everybody knew who God was all of a sudden. Well, that's not the message. Uh, it, let's get in the Bible here for a little bit. Go to John chapter 16, verse 12. I want to talk to you today about how to be fluent in the language of heaven. So let me ask you this question. Do you speak heaven? Do you speak heaven? Can you speak heaven? Okay. And I'm not talking about praying in the spirit. I'm talking about speaking the language of heaven. Okay. Now, let me ask you a couple of other things. All right. How many of you speak Facebook? Any of you speak Facebook? How many of you speak Twitter? There's a language all its own on Twitter. You know, anyone know what BFF means? Best friends forever. Very good. Okay. Uh, LOL. Okay. So you speak Facebook and you speak Twitter. All right. How many of you know the Ten Commandments in order? One, two, three. <laughs> I'm not getting I just That was just a slam, man. I just slammed you. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're like, um, whoops. <laughs> See, here's the deal. Not, not that you have to know the Ten Commandments in order, but we need to get more acclimated to the language of heaven than the language of the world we live in. Okay? Now, it's good to be current. It's good to be relevant. It's good to you know, know who you're talking to and what's going on around you so that you can converse with people around you. But uh, God's doing something in our language. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about... Uh, foreign languages. I'm talking about languages within a language. Okay? Now, we speak English, all right? But if you go over to New Orleans and you talk to some of those Cajun folks over there, and you say, hey, how you doing? And they go, how do you mean? They're speaking English, but you don't understand a word they're saying. Unless you go over there and you soak in some gumbo for a while. And then you can begin to understand a little bit about what they're saying. Now, it's still English, but it's a different language, okay? If you've never been on Facebook before, and you get on Facebook, and they're throwing all these, you know, initials at you, or you get on Twitter, and, the, you know, it's, it's, all these letters are coming at you, you have no idea what they're saying. See, it's a, it's a foreign language, but it's English, okay? So here's what I'm talking to you about, okay? We've learned the language of religion, but God is speaking some things from heaven that he's wanting us to connect with in a whole new way. So let's look at this in John chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. And Jesus makes this statement to the 12 men who have been following him and living with him for three and a half years. This is at the Last Supper. Jesus says this in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Okay? So Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, I have a lot of things that I want to tell you, but you can't bear them now. Now, this whole concept just exploded on the inside of me. Uh, Jill, wave hi, Jill. Jill was in our youth group 25 years ago. She's, she, I think she was five when she was in our youth group. 
But uh, anyways, she, she helped us. She babysat for us. She took care of us. Jill's studying nursing right now. She got a hold of this book uh, that, was, that I thought was very interesting, and I was reading it the other day. Uh, it's called A Framework for Understanding Poverty by Ruby Payne, Ph.D., and in it, she's talking about the role of language and story. Now, Ruby Payne is an educator, and she teaches educators, but she, she teaches them how to understand the whole concept of poverty that young people are coming from for the purpose of helping young people coming from poverty and a survival mentality to get more into a middle-class mentality so they have a better chance at jobs and a better chance at education and a better chance to go to college. She helps them, she helps educators to help kids to come up to a new level by understanding where they're coming from. So she talks to educators about the language of poverty. Now there's, there's some different registers of language within the English language. Let me explain this to you real quick, okay? There's frozen language. That's language that's always the same, like the Lord's Prayer. It's always the same. There's language like the Pledge of Allegiance. It's always the same, all right? That's frozen that's frozen register of language. There's formal language, and that's the standard s sentence language that's used as work at work in school, okay? Then there's consultive language, which is formal register when used in conversation. Then there's casual language, language between friends and characterized by a 400 to 800 word vocabulary. Then there's intimate language, and that's language between lovers or close family members. Okay, so there's these major differences in language. Now, people who come from poverty converse in a casual language format, okay? Uh, they might use lots of slang, they use lots of stories, and that's how they converse, but they're coming from a mentality of survival. And a lot of their survival is dependent on their conversation and using humor like if a, a kid coming from poverty is at school and he gets in trouble at school, he'll try to laugh his way out of it or joke his way out of it because he doesn't know how to negotiate his way out of it because the language of middle class is negotiation and goal setting. Okay? Well, I'm reading through this stuff by this educator, this PhD, and things are going off on the inside of me because I see the body of Christ in a survival mode. They're just trying to make it. And people, instead of going, God, what church do you want me to go to? What church is my same spiritual DNA? What church can I contribute to? Instead of doing that, they go, what church am I comfortable in? What church do I like the flavor of? What church can I go and hide in? Hide from what? What are you hiding from, church? I'm not talking to you. I'm just talking about the body of Christ in general. I see a lot of survival mentality, and I see a lot of spiritual poverty. And as a result of it, the language that many people in the body of Christ have been speaking is this casual language. And, and when you come from that kind of background and you use, use casual language for everything, it's like a young person coming from that background trying to get a job. They're at a job interview, and they say, well, tell me a little bit about your experience. And, yo, yo, one time, I just did it. Well, you ain't getting the job. Why? Because there's a language to getting in there. Okay? And it's the same way in the kingdom of heaven. There's a language of heaven that's going to cause us to come up. Now, when Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them yet. I just looked at that for a little bit. I just thought it was very interesting because there's, you know, what do you bear? What kinds of things do you bear? I guess for an example, we could use like, for instance, the president of the United States. If I told you right now, you, next time around, next go around, you are going to be the president of the United States, that would be telling you more than you could bear. Why? Because you, right now, I mean, unless you've been a governor, a senator, a president of your own corporation, it would be difficult for your mind to wrap around the concept of you being in charge of a whole country. See? I mean, I think about Governor Mike Huckabee. He's been a governor. He's managed a state. He's got all of that. He ran for president. I'm pretty sure God told him to run for president. You know? And as a result of it, he's got a platform that he basically he carries himself on that platform 
And, and people are able to relate to him on that level because he's in that leadership level. Okay? And so here's some things that, that you bear. You could bear the weight of something. Like the responsibility, like bear the responsibility. Responsibility of being president of the United States is huge. I can't even imagine. How about bear the title of president? How about bear the pain? I mean, you do, you do without a lot to be a president of a country. You bear the punishment. Boy, the media, you know, whoever's president, the media will get you. They don't care. They just want to make news. And if they can create a scandal, they will, right? So bearing the weight, the punishment, the responsibility, bearing, the, uh, uh, bearing, bearing with the... the <laughs> How long it takes, I think about our congressmen and our senators, and how long sometimes they have to wait for something to change, you know? I mean, that's huge. They have to have a ton of patience in order to move into that level. Okay, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about you coming up a level and being able to wrap your spirit, your heart, around a greater responsibility from where you are. I'm not talking about going from where you are to being president of the United States. I'm talking about going from where you are to your next level. Because you have a next level. You have a, a, a position that God's wanting to bring you up to, to operate within, that's got more responsibility. It's got more weight to it. It's got more influence. And it's going to make a difference there. Now, Jesus told his disciples, I've got a lot of things to tell you, but you can't carry it now. You can't bear it now, okay? Then he goes on, he says, but the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to show you, all, he's going to show you the truth. He's going to bring you up to a new level, okay? Now, say this with me. The Holy Ghost is bringing me up to a new level. Now, that's where we're going, okay? That's what the Holy Ghost wants to do. He wants to bring you to a new level. All right, let's go to another scripture verse. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're going up to a new level. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 15. It says this, For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Okay, I want you to look at somebody and say this. Look at somebody. Say this. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Okay, now this is what God's wanting us to get to, is having blessed eyes and ears spiritually. All right? Blessed spiritual eyes and blessed spiritual ears. He's not just talking about your eyeballs and your ears that you hear sounds with, there is a spiritual sound and a spiritual vision that God is releasing that he's wanting us to come up to. He was wanting the disciples to come up to it. Okay? Now, the disciples, this is so amazing. that The, the scripture verse that we just read, uh, G, this is what Jesus was dealing with, is dullness of eyes, dullness of hearing. They couldn't see it. They couldn't grasp it. Jesus told him, I've got a lot of things that I want to tell you. I can't tell you now, but the Holy Ghost is going to come, and he's going to speak it to you, okay? So they're there in the upper room. Uh, they're there at the Last Supper. Then Jesus begins to tell him, he goes, okay, no longer am I going to speak to you in parables, but now I'm going to tell you plainly of the Father. And they clicked into a new gear, and they said, now we understand that you are from the Father, and now we believe. And Jesus asked him, do you really believe? Before the night's over, you're all going to run away. See, so they weren't quite there yet. They weren't quite ready yet because their hearing was dull. They were having a difficult time hearing it. God is wanting you to hear some things in a more specific, strategic way than you've heard before. Why? <laughs> This shouldn't be a huge pressure on you. This should be liberating. This isn't conforming you into something that's trying to mold you into a religious format so that you're all bound up. 
This is God trying to turn you loose on this world so that everything he's done inside of you can be uh, this amazing blessing to everybody around you. See? God's wanting to turn us loose. He's not trying to put more rules on us. Uh, this morning, I'm not saying, oh, you know, you have to hear better. You have to, oh, pressure. Oh, no, he's trying to turn loose the leadership in us, the influence in us, the, the, the things that would change everything around us that is already on the inside of us. He's trying to turn it loose. We need to move from being dull of hearing to being sharp. You know, Peter, he, went, he underwent a huge change, an amazing change. He's over there denying that he even knows Jesus, you know, when Jesus is on trial. And uh, then he's ashamed and goes out and weeps. And then he goes and hides and goes back to fishing. And then Jesus comes and appears to Peter and says, come on, let's do this thing. Well, I'm sure he was still dealing with some of this. They go to the upper room. They're in there. They're praying. The Holy Ghost falls on them. Guess who stands up? Peter stands up, opens his mouth, and turns loose what's on the inside of him. Three and a half years of Jesus teaching him, saturated with the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden turns him loose. He opens his mouth, starts saying some stuff, and 3,000 people get saved in a day. Everyone say, in a day. In a day. Okay, now, I wonder what else could happen in a day. What else could happen in a day if you get turned loose? I mean, if, if all of a sudden what's on the inside of you gets turned loose, I mean the anointing that God has placed in you, the destiny, the spiritual DNA that God has put on the inside of you, what happens when that gets turned loose? What is going to happen around you? Can you imagine everyone you meet, you pay off their house? I mean, what, you think some people would come to church if you started doing stuff like that? You know, the church that pays off your house. Can I say this? I'm going to, I'm going to, I am, this burns inside of me. I am so angry at our financial system and our financial systems are being judged. You know, I mean, we've seen a lot of financial institutions fall. Why? Because it's, it's unrighteous. It's unjust. Okay. You're buying a hundred thousand dollar house, a 30 year note, thousand dollars a month. 10% interest costs you $300,000. You're paying three times the price of that just so that you can get in it now. That is ungodly. Now, I'm not getting on your case. You say, well, I have a 30-year note. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to... I'm not mad at you, but this system... Can you imagine a Christian bank giving you a loan and only getting 10%? Never thought of that, did you? See, now this is what I'm talking about. God's wanting to release some new things. God's wanting to release some new things. Pastor Bill Winston up in the Chicago area, God led him to go to this mall and, and to buy this mall. They didn't want to sell it to him, but God wanted him to have it, so he got it. He started a bank, his own bank. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about some new thoughts, some new thinking here, some new things. Can we get this going here a little bit? God's wanting to turn us loose to do some things in our generation that's going to change the face of everything. Okay? And when it changes, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. All right? But we're not going to get it if we're dull of hearing. We're not going to get it if we stay back here. You know, we can stay back here. God will let us stay back here. You know, we can be there, but there's something for you that's just ahead. That's so exciting and so amazing. That's just going to put everything on the map. And people aren't going to be able to stay away when all of a sudden this, starts, this stuff starts happening. Okay, so dull of hearing, all right? God doesn't want you dull of hearing. God doesn't want you living in parables. God wants your eyes to see and your ears to hear. God wants you to hear the language of heaven. God doesn't want it like you go down to New Orleans and everybody's talking Cajun and you don't understand a word of it. And it's really hard to get anything done. It's really hard to, to communicate with any. God doesn't want heaven, 
heaven's operations like that anymore. What does God want? God wants you to be able to hear what he's saying and understand what he's meaning. Years and years ago, Cindy and I were just married, and uh, it was Christmas time, and we went on a road trip. We got in our car. We were heading out the middle of the country. We were going to go visit our friends in Kansas. We were going to go f- visit my brother up in Minnesota, and uh, we're driving along, and there was this one issue that we had. I don't even remember what it was now, but we had this one issue that we would argue about, and we hadn't been married, you know, maybe six months, not even six months, but there was this... Uh, that's somewhere in the, I don't know. Anyways, we had this one issue that any time it came up, we would argue about it. And we'd, you know, just, it was grating. It was not good. And we would try to communicate with each other, but we'd get angry. And it was not any fun. Well, anyway, here we are in a car for hours, hours, hours. And we're driving, and this issue came up. And we started talking about it. And she said, well, you know, I, what I meant when I said that is this. And I'm like, really? Well, what I meant when I said this was that. And understanding came. We were in communication, but we weren't in understanding. And when understanding comes, all of a sudden you're on the same page. We found out that we were arguing about nothing. But we were in two different places on it because of our communication skills. Because we weren't seeing face to face and eye to eye. God's wanting to bring us into this new place of seeing face-to-face and eye-to-eye and understanding what he's saying. Many times when God says something to us, when God speaks to us, especially in a prophetic church, we get a word and it's like, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, most of the time when God gives you a prophetic word, it's so you will take that and you begin praying over it so that understanding can come. See, getting a prophetic word without spending time in the presence of God, you're not going to get all you're supposed to get. You're not going to glean all of it. So God's wanting to bring us back into his presence and bring us the understanding that we need so we can have hearing ears once again. All right, there's another scripture verse. Let's go to that one. Mark chapter 4, verse 24. This is in the Amplified Bible. And he said to them, Be careful about what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, and more besides will be given to you who hear. Okay? Now, for years, I thought that this whole passage that Jesus was talking was pretty unfair. He says, blessed to you who have, for more will be given. I thought, well, bummer. You know, if you don't have anything, you don't get anything, or, you know, how how do you get started here in this program? Jesus is talking about hearing. Blessed are you when you can hear. Well, he just got done giving them the parable of the sower and the seed. Okay? And then now he's explaining to them the parable of the sower and the seed, helping them with some understanding. He's giving them a little bit of understanding on what's going on. Okay? And he gives us this beautiful key in the Amplified Bible. It's just awesome. He says... Essentially, the measure of thought and study you give to the word you hear is the measure of understanding and power and know-how that will come to you. What is that? That's Joshua 1.8. Meditate on the word day and night. What word? The written word. The spoken word. The personal word you get in prayer in the morning. Whatever word you get, spend some time cooking it. Put it in your spiritual crock pot, uh, turn it on high, and let it cook. Let it go. I'll be preparing for a message, and you know, it's, and I'll, but I'll be walking around the house, and I'll be doing stuff. Cindy says, I thought you were studying for your message. I'm like, no, I'm cooking it. It's in the crock pot. I'm cooking. It's in there. It's, it's working, but it's pulling all the flavors of what God is saying to you out so that you can have understanding. But it's the measure of thought and study you give to the word you hear that is the measure that comes back to you. Okay? And then, that's when you begin to understand. If you moved to New Orleans, it wouldn't be very long to where you knew what everybody was saying. Why? Because you're right there in the middle of it. You're hearing it. You begin to understand that means serve me up some gumbo. Because, you know, because you're around it and you begin to understand it, okay? 
Now, let me give you some, some languages here, all right? I, I, I got to tell you this story. This is great. Uh, Cindy, my wife, she, uh, she grew up with four sisters. There were five girls in the family. And uh, she was the tomboy. So she would go fishing with dad. So she understands about fishing and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I didn't, okay? I didn't grow up with fishing at all. I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. So a couple of weeks ago, Cindy's dad said, could you help us? Uh, we need to sell our boat. They had a bass boat, and uh, they wanted us to sell it for them. So we brought it to our house over here in Hearst, and, uh, you know, put it on uh, Craigslist, uh, advertises for sale, okay? I don't know anything about boats. I didn't know how to start it, you know? Uh, we just wrote down some of the details about it. It's people call and ask questions, and they're like, what about this? I don't know. What about that? I, I have no idea. I don't speak boat. <laughs> Any of you out there speak boat? Any of you? It's one of you. One of you speaks, but two of you speak boat. Okay? Well, I don't speak boat. I'm, it's totally foreign to me. So anyways, uh, just about a week ago, I guess it was maybe last weekend or so, uh, got a call. A couple wanted to come down from Sherman, look at the boat. They drove all the way down, took them three hours. They got there. He's asking all these questions. I don't have a lot of answers. Uh, let's start it up. I, it won't start. I call my father-in-law. Uh, he's not sure what to tell me over the phone. You have to actually be there. So we're stuck. We're just stuck. How many of you have ever felt stuck? Okay. We were stuck. Okay. So Cindy gets on the internet and she's like, okay, boat repair. And this number comes up. She gives it to me. She's call this number. So I call the number and it was a mobile repair boat guy. And he was in the neighborhood. He said, I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> I'm like, thank God, somebody who speaks boat. <laughs> so he comes to the house and, you know, he's opening stuff and pulling stuff out. I don't know what he's doing. I'd never seen that before. He's like, oh, this and that and this and that. And that. <laughs> Starts it right up. Uh, he says, uh, we need this uh, thing that goes on the engine to hook the hose up to, to put the water through. So he ran over to the store, came back in five minutes, hooked the thing up to turn the water on. The water's going through it. The engine's running. It's, it's you know, the, the guy from Sherman says, you know, well, I was thinking about getting this other kind of boat. And uh, Mr. Boat Guy says, oh, no, you don't want one of those boats. This is the kind of boat you want right here. This is the boat you want to buy. These boats are made quality. Those other boats, man, they just come off the factory line and they're junk. I've worked on hundreds of those boats. You want this kind of boat. This is the boat you want. In fact, if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. And so it's like now the pressure's on, you know. And I'm like, thank God someone came along and speaks boat. He got that thing sold. And, you know, we're thinking, okay, he's going to charge us $50, $100 or something for making the house call. You know, I mean, house call. And uh, Cindy goes, well, how much do we owe you? He says, $20. I'm like, I love this man. You know? And he not only speaks boat, but he sold the boat. And, you know, gives us the deal of a lifetime, which is awesome. Now, this is why many of you have come to the church here. Okay? Because when you came, you didn't speak heaven. When you came, you know, things, people would say things and preaching and different things, and you didn't understand the language of heaven. You hung around this for a little while, and all of a sudden it starts clicking. It's like, oh, yeah, that's how you start this thing. Oh, yeah, that's how this thing flows. Oh, yeah, that's how this thing works. And this, you know, you came here, and man, it's a good deal. It's right here, right in the middle of Dallas-Fort Worth. And you can come, and you can hear the language of heaven. And you can begin to understand when, when you're in your prayer closet and you're on your knees and you're going, God, what about this and that? And God speaks something to you, you can begin to have understanding of it because you've been here. Because of the prophetic anointing that's here. Now, when Jesus showed up, I'm going to wrap it up with this. When Jesus showed up, he made some parallels uh, to show people how to begin to understand the language of heaven. Okay? Now, remember when he came to Peter, James, and John, and he just showed up. He says, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for it. Jesus spoke fishermen, okay? I don't, I don't know how he knew that. He was a carpenter, but he spoke fishermen. Launch out into the deep, let your nets down for a catch. 
And they did, and it did, and they had this huge catch. And then Jesus says to Peter, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter, James, and John left all, left their dads, left the business, left the boats, left the nets, left the huge catch of fish, which was a huge profit, and they followed him. Well, they heard something. They heard something they hadn't heard before. Okay? So that leads me to believe that if you know how to talk fishermen, that it'll be easier to understand heaven. Cindy and I were talking about this when so many people came and looked at the boat. Uh, I told Cindy one day, I said, you know what? It's, it's so interesting. Fishermen are the nicest people in the world. They're patient. They're kind. You know, they come and it's, well, what about this? What about that? How does that work? And this... Just how long have you had that? You know, they're just the sweetest people in the world. And I thought, you know, I, I'm sure all of these character qualities are Jesus' character qualities. Patient and kind and loving and, you know, soft-spoken, just awesome. So if you speak fisherman, you can understand heaven a little bit easier. Here's another one. If you speak farmer, you can understand heaven. How many parables did Jesus say, okay, sower, seed, ground, dirt, trees, fruit? You know, what is he doing? He's talking farmer. If you can talk farmer, how many of you talk farmer? Any of you talk farmer? Any of you have a garden? Any of you grow anything? If you can talk farmer, you can understand heaven a little bit easier. Okay? Now, here's another one. If you can talk kid, Jesus took a, brought a little kid in front of him and he said, look, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like right here, this kid. And they're all looking at that going, huh? he says, you've got to come simply. You've got to come innocently. You've got to come open. You've got to come trusting in order to understand the kingdom of heaven. Okay? If you can talk kid, you can understand heaven a little bit better. Now, I have six grandkids, so I know how to talk kid. I can interpret Barney. Uh, you know, all, all of that stuff. I can talk kid a little bit. And I, it's just really interesting to me. My, my grandson, Devin, who's seven years old, his, one of the, the things he likes to do the most is talk favorites. When they spend the night, uh, he'll be laying there and I'll be tucking him in. We'll be saying our prayers and he'll go, g -paw, that's me, I'm g -paw. g -paw, let's talk favorites. I go, okay. Uh, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite? And invariably, it always comes back to food. I don't know why, but it always comes back to food. What's your favorite fast food? What's your favorite ice cream? What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite milkshake flavor? And just usually all comes back to food. Uh, but he loves to talk about favorites, okay? Now, this is a point I want to make with this. When's the last time you sat down with God and told him all your favorites? Okay? What is that? That's talking kid. You're the kid. He's the father. When's the last time you sat in his lap and told him what would be really cool if it happened? Let me put it this way. When's the last time you really dreamed? We go through life and circumstances and situations come at us and pile up on us and weigh us down and burden us down and make us dull of hearing. At some point, somewhere in time, we have to unload all of that and we need to begin to dream again. We need to begin to talk about our favorites again. We need to be talking about growth again, like a farmer would talk about growth. We need to be able to talk about, uh, you know, fishermen talk about, you know, where's the best place to fish? Well, where's the best place to hear from God? Do you have a place like that? That's how fishermen think. You know, where's the best place to catch something? Where's the best place to pull something in? We need to begin thinking like that. We need to be thinking, you know, what seeds do I need to be sowing? You know, we did this for years. We were a traveling youth ministry, and for years we told youth groups, who are you tithing to? And they'd never thought about that before. As a youth group, they didn't tithe. It's like, well, wouldn't it be good if your youth group tithed to a ministry that's going all over the world, and then you could believe God for a return in that youth group? And they're like, wow. And they started sowing. They started thinking farmer. 
They started sowing and they started reaping. They started understanding some of these heaven things. Okay? Now, I'm stirring you up this morning and I'm stretching a little bit, but God's wanting to do some supernatural things in us. God's wanting to clear our ears out again. God's wanting us to unload these burdens and these things that have come on us that makes us, you know, we don't even want to hear anymore, hardly, sometimes, after we've been through so much. But God is stirring us up. God's saying, look, I want to refresh you. I want to turn you loose. I don't want to put you in a religious mold. I want to turn you loose on this planet. I want to create something in you. I want you to speak the language of heaven. I want you to be able to hear me and understand me. I want you to go out there and do the things that I've destined you to do. So that's what he's speaking to us today. Okay? Now, what's our part? We got to pay attention. Fishermen pay attention. Farmers pay attention. When you talk kid, when you're talking to a little kid, you got to pay attention to what they're saying. You can't just say, you know, blah, blah, this and that, go out and play. If you want a connection, you got to really pay attention. And you got to start pulling stuff out of there. See? This is where God's bringing us. We need to pay more attention. The same amount of thought and study you give to the word you hear is the same amount of power, the same amount of ability, the same amount of freedom that's going to come back to you. You don't have to learn a whole bunch of brand new stuff. God's already put a bunch of stuff in you. God's wanting to take that. Peter had a big mouth. Did you notice that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Peter had a big mouth. God used that big mouth and 3,000 people got saved. Whatever your biggest problem is, God wants to put his anointing all over it and turn it loose on the world. You know? I, I mean, think about it. You, you might go, but I'm a big dork. <laughs> well, what a miracle, you know? You get up and signs, wonders, and miracles happen, and you're a dork. You know, people are going to come just to see that. <laughs> I mean, think about it, you know? It's, it's not about us anyway. It's about God, okay? God wants to take what he's already put inside of you and turn it loose on the world so that you can be a blessing to everybody around you. I want you to stand up to your feet right now. Uh, uh, worship team, if you guys could come. God's going to move on you today. Cindy, why don't you come up here and help me? We're going to pray for some people. If, if, you, if, you're, if this is you, okay, if you feel like you've been dull of hearing, if you feel like it's been so long since you've been able to hear from God, so long since you've been able to really connect and really understand and really feel that, wow, God's, God's whispering His voice to me and I'm receiving it. If that's you, if that's you, and you want to be turned loose today to be able to hear again the voice of God, then I want you to come up to the front. Father, in Jesus' name, as they're coming, I thank you, Lord God, that you're touching hearts all over this place. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that your wisdom, your understanding is available. Father, I thank you that your power, your goodness, your grace, your authority, your anointing, God, it's there for us. God, we want to speak heaven. We want to hear the words of heaven. We want to move, Father, in, in the things of heaven. In Jesus' name. Oh, we want it, Father. We want it. We need it. In Jesus' name.